My name is John Ferris. I'm the lead front-end developer at Atten Design Group, uh, based out of <clears throat> excuse me, Denver, Colorado, in the States. And Atten is a design, development, and strategy shop, helping organizations like these create positive train change throughout the world. But today, I want to talk to you about problems. And I'll, I'll save you all from having to raise your hands, and I'm just going to assume that most of you in here are either a designer, a developer, or an engineer. And you chose that path because deep down, you like solving problems. Like you see something in this world that's broken and you want to fix it, and you want to make it better. And we end up having to solve a lot of the same problems over and over. And we end up using uh, common solutions to those problems. And what you end up with are design patterns. And design patterns are just common solutions to reoccurring problems within a given context. So to give you an example of that, one of the reoccurring problems I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, usually multiple times a day, I imagine you guys do too, probably dealing with them, or you might be dealing with it right now, is that I get hungry. And when I get hungry, I can sometimes turn into a jerk, you know, I might start screwing up, putting typos in my commit messages, um, just being snippy with, with my coworkers. Um, so stuff like this can happen. And one of the common solutions that I use quite often to solve the hungry problem is tacos. Tacos are incredibly flexible, very reusable. Um, you can make them in different ways. You just need, you know, flour or corn tortilla. You need, um, you can use beef or chicken, ground beef, shredded beef, dried beef, fish, shrimp, all kinds of different things. You can, you can create the, the taco pattern with all kinds of different um, iterations. You can even make it with ice cream. But tacos aren't always going to solve your hungry problem. Um, context is important. So, for one, you have to like tacos. If you don't like tacos, then tacos probably aren't going to be the right solution for you. Um, you have to be able to get them. My wife and I lived in Australia last year, and it was really hard to find Mexican food in Australia. So, we ended up solving our hungry problem with the curry pattern or the, the meat pie pattern. We had to use different solutions to fix the problem at the time. But today we're going to talk about layouts. And just so we're all, the, all on the same page of what a layout is, layouts kind of create the structure of your page. Um, so these are the containers on your page that you would put, uh, like your design components. You know, later on, I think today, John Albin's going to be talking about design components. What he's talking about in that session, that's the stuff that goes into your layouts. Um, so layouts uh, hold the content. These components within your layout can have layouts themselves, so it's all recursive. Uh, it's all controlled or it's dictated by the HTML. So the order in which your HTML is written and what's nested and what's next to each other, that all affects layout and it's important. Um, and then you kind of control that layout with the subset of CSS properties. So you have like your flow properties, like display and flex and float. You have your positioning prop properties, so top, right, left, bottom. Uh, and then you have your box sizing pro properties to actually size your containers. So the properties that affect that, like padding and margin and width. Um, So this is an example of a site with a fairly complex layout. This is a site we did earlier uh, this year for Colorado Public Radio. 
Um, and there's a lot, of, a lot of layout problems to solve here. If we look at it without those properties we just talked about, we end up with this. You know, we have some background colors and font sizes and font colors, but it looks like a jumbled mess. The layout's important. So how do we get from this back to this? Well, it can be overwhelming to look at a, um, an entire site like this and figure out how you're going to rearrange things and structure things. So it's helpful to kind of break it down. Um, we have kind of this, this basic problem on this page of we have main content on the left and another column or sidebar, whatever you want to call it, on the right. And that's a pretty simple problem to solve, much easier than the rest of it. But if we look at, you know, other details in the site, that same two-column pattern shows up over and over. So we have the main menu at the top is a left column to the social menu on the right. Um, a featured area is split into two columns with thumbnails on the right and the main featured article on the left. And we have other... Um, items, other featured news items at the bottom. Um, and like I said earlier, they're recursive. So even inside the, um, the left column, inside the left column, or inside the right column, you have those thumbnails that are, again, broken out to two columns. So if we can come up with a, a common solution to solve this two-column column problem, then it'll work throughout, and we save ourselves a lot of work, and we can basically create this layout very efficiently. Um, so look, let's look at some actual patterns. So I want to start off real simple. And this first pattern I call constrained elements. Give an element a defined width to prevent it from expanding too wide. It doesn't get much simpler than that. So let's look at an example. We have this really wide um, column of text. You know, the measure here is a little, little too, too wide to make it readable. And if we want to kind of constrain that, we just put a width on it and shrink it down. Now it's a little bit more legible. So that's simple, but we can, we can take that one pattern, apply it to a, a class, and I'll just call it L, dash dash constrain. That's just a, one of the naming conventions we use. And all this has is, you know, at a certain breakpoint, it's got a width set on it or it just has a max width. And we could take that one class and apply it to all these rows of content to make sure that everything is um, aligned and doesn't bleed out until the, the actual edge. So that's simple. We use it all over the place. Um, the next one that's related to that is rows of relevant content. So divide the screen into rows of relevant content such that the hierarchy and content relationships are preserved across different screen sizes. So looking at that, that same site, um, we have on the left here, we have these rows of, uh, rows of content that are all related to each other. We don't have like a, a long sidebar running down the side. And that's helpful when we get down to um, this mobile layout that everything that's related on the large screen is still related. Um, the proximity is reserved or preserved, and it all still, still makes sense. So another example of that, this is um, one of the subsites for that Colorado public radio site we just looked at. Here we had an issue where the actual desktop design called for this um, kind of continuous sidebar down the side. But at the top of that sidebar, we have ads. And the ads are really important to the site because that's where they get their, um, a lot of their revenue to actually uh, run the radio station. And no, nobody buying ads wants to buy an ad that's shoved down to the bottom. So when we got to, or when we were designing this for tablets, or mobile view, we needed to make sure that that ad was still relatively close to the top. Um, so what we ended up doing is breaking that sidebar up into essentially two sidebars, 
And that way, when it reflowed for tablet and mobile layouts, we could kind of keep that, that uh, add up towards the top. Um, so now I'm going to talk about the layout modifiers pattern. To follow a naming convention for classes intended to modify layout. Um, so here's an example of just some markup where you have one container and three kind of sections within it. And we'll call those primary, secondary, and tertiary. I try to name these with a, a sort of a like a, a vague reusable um, class. So that no matter what uh, modifier class we give it, the one at the top, like L dash dash modifier, um, those sub subclasses of primary, secondary, and tertiary will still make sense. Um, and I want to point out that we're using the two dashes, the sort of smack style, um, the two dashes for the modifier class and the one dash for that, that subcomponent. We treat these sub elements of the layout as if they were subcomponents. Um, so it's just what the, the markup would look like. And then we can add a class. So L dash dash three dash column. So a three column layout. Um, the, the actual CSS below, this is just shorthand. I'm using, um, in this instance, it's SUSE. So a grid framework that we'll talk a little bit more about later. Uh, we're just saying basically for each, each of those columns, assuming that's a 12 column grid, make them each four columns wide and place them uh, at even intervals across. So sidebars after. Uh, just adjust a little bit so we have the sidebars coming after the um, the main content area. Sidebars before, just flip those. And then triptych where we have the sidebars running down the side. So all these are using the same HTML structure for the layout itself. But just by switching out that one class, we can apply the different CSS to actually create these different layouts which is really handy when you're actually developing. Um, component layouts, uh, this is the exact same thing, just with a slightly different naming convention. Uh, often find that when you're creating layouts for like specific components, like you think of like a, a node teaser or something like that, that the actual layout within it is, can be very specific to that component and it doesn't really make it very reusable. So I just use a slightly modified uh, naming convention for those. And I do want to point out the uh, direct child selector that um, I guess it would be a greater than or caret symbol. Now that's specifying um, that only apply this style to like the article, fee article figure if it's a direct descendant of article teaser. Uh, this is less important on the, the component layouts, but if we go back to, say, where we have primary, secondary, and tertiary, we're using these kind of vague naming conventions, that we can actually do that recursive nesting of layouts inside layouts. And because we're using this direct descendant selector, those styles aren't going to bleed into, say, you have a, a primary class further down. Um, so that's that's very helpful. Browser support on it is really good. So you could definitely use it. Um, this next pattern is called gutter pull. So position an item by pulling it into the gutter established by its parent container. So this is just an you know, example of you know, maybe an article with a, a block quote in it. And we want to pull that block quote off to the side to kind of highlight it a little bit. So. We take that quote, we float it left, and give it a, a defined width. And that allows that text to wrap around. And then using the gutter pull pattern, we just apply negative margin or negative left margin to that quote. And that'll pull it into the gutter, and the rest of the content will follow it. So that can be helpful in certain cases. Another example of where that's, that's helpful is um, say we have a a book listing and our markup looks similar to what we were just looking at. We have 
um, this book teaser container or layout, and the book cover, book title, um, authors, and summary. And all those are kind of running together. They're all um, siblings of each other. What we want to do is have that um, book cover pulled off to the side and let everything wrap around it. So on the container, we add some left padding to kind of create this gutter. And then we take the book cover and we float it left and then add that negative margin to pull it into the gutter. So now we have this like two column layout that we were looking at earlier. Nice thing about this is we didn't have to wrap extra divs around stuff. Um, if we resize this, you know, we can keep that uh, left column fixed. You know, if we want, we don't want to resize the image. And all this text will keep flowing straight down and kind of preserve that, that grid structure. It's not going to wrap around the book cover if the text gets long. So it's, it's very helpful. Um, margin overflow is another way we can exploit the kind of negative margin uh, properties. So allow an element to overflow its container by applying negative margins to both the left and right sides. So here's an example of like a common block. We have a block title and some block content. So you've probably seen this markup a lot if you do a lot of Drupal work. Um, and then applying negative margins to either side of the title, we can actually have that title expand out beyond the edges of that container. So that works for creating some fancy block titles. Uh, another place that that pattern can be applied is say we have three columns, and each one of those is just defined by um, you know, setting the width to 33.33%, um, floating them left, and then adding padding to each one. So it's very simple to create this three column layout, but there's a problem there in that the actual edges of the, the text aren't lining up with our grid. Like these are, these are pushed in. So using the margin overflow, we just set a negative margin of whatever the padding size is to kind of expand that, that container out beyond its parent, and that lines everything up. So there's other ways to tackle this, you know, using like nth child or whatever. So it kind of depends on, you know, the context that you would use it. And if you're, if you have to support older browsers that don't um, support like the nth child selector, you'll need to do something like this to get things to line up. Um, this one's kind of fun, intrinsic ratios. When the aspect ratio of an element is known, but the target size is not, use padding and absolute positioning to preserve the aspect ratio of an element. So a good example of this is like a YouTube video, which are normally added to a page with an iframe. And I'm sure if anyone has done responsive sites where you have video or embedded media like that, uh, these can be painful. So you can't do the, the max width 100% like you can with an image. The browser doesn't know what the aspect ratio of an iframe is like it does with an image. So what you have to do is actually, oh, here's an example of it going wrong. This is just using the max width. Um, so in order to fix this, we take the parent container and we add top padding to it, which is um, the ratio, like the actual aspect ratio of the YouTube video or whatever that, that we're embedding. And this is due to the fact that when you define top and bottom padding as a percentage, it's actually a percentage of the width of the element, not a percentage of the height. So, we're essentially creating this, this padding area along the top. Um, that is the aspect ratio of the video that we want. So we just take the video itself, we absolute position that at the top, and then give it a height and width of 100%. And then if our, our container expands or contracts, then 
so does our video. So there's other there's libraries out there like FitVids that handles this for you. It's pretty much the CSS that it uses. I think the only advantage to using that is it'll actually calculate what that that aspect ratio is if you don't happen to know it ahead of time. Like I know that all the YouTube videos that we're embedding on a site are going to be the same ratio. So I don't necessarily need to use that library. But if there are other, you know, if you're using Vimeo and you have just varied width um, things, you might need to look at Fitbits. So now I want to talk about grids. And the overall grid system pattern is divide the screen into a series of vertical columns to facilitate the organization and alignment of components. Um, so just to give an example of this, this is the, a grid overlaying the Indianapolis Museum of Art sites. Um, you just see that we're aligning all this, this content along, along the grid to keep things kind of ordered and clean. I'm not going to get into a lot of why you should use grids. Um, I think they're a good idea. There's great books out there that, that go way more in depth about like, the value of grids and how to design them. Uh, Ordering Disorder by Koi Ben and Designing for the Web by Mark Bolton. I uh, highly recommend both those. But I want to talk about the actual patterns that you would use to implement grids on the site. Um, so you have a guttered grid. So for each grid unit in the grid system, include a gutter to help space content. You know, if you dealt with grids before, like 960 grid, this, you know, you've seen this a lot. This is how we do a lot of grids. So this is just a simple 12 column, uh, 12, yeah, 12 column grid on Drupal.org. Um, so we have these columns and there's set gutters in between that help space the content. So another option you have is a gutterless grid. And this is how we've been designing sites for the last eight months or so. Um, so you exclude gutters from the grid unit Instead, use empty columns as the gutters themselves. So with this Colorado Public Radio site, we just got rid of the get grids altogether and did 24 columns. And we actually use some of the columns themselves as the gutter. Um, I find this as a front end developer much easier to work with because you're not having to deal with um, some of those like nested padding issues that you often get with like a grid system. and gutters. Uh, in this particular case, we used a, a 24 column grid. Now we often use a 23 column grid. And that actually works out because since you are using um, columns for the gutters, if you have a 23 column grid and you want to do a two column layout, you can have 11 columns on one side, 11 columns on the other side and then one, one column down the middle. Um, it works for you know, three, three columns, four columns. I think it even works for five columns. Um, but I find that, as a front-end developer, much easier to work with, and our, our designers are enjoying it as well. So symmetric grid. Construct a grid from equal width grid units. Again, it's the same thing. Um, what we're showing here is that each of these columns are the exact same width all the way across. Um, back to the, the Drupal.org example, same thing. It's made of 12 equal columns. So another option we have is the asymmetric grid. So construct a grid from varied width grid units designed for the content. Um, so this is where we're actually designing a specific grid layout based on the actual content of your site. So this is an example from a, a blog post that Mark Bolton did of like an e-commerce site that's selling t-shirts and it's the grid is constructed around this photo of the t-shirt and the actual information going down the side, um, the, the colors on the edge. So this, this grid is very specific to the content. Um, this, the math involved with doing this kind of made these, I don't want to say impossible, but 
a little too tedious to implement in the past, but now with um, you know preprocessors like SAS and Less, it's this is far more doable and actually pretty easy now. Uh, I think it's just a matter of when you're actually designing the site at the beginning. That's a decision you have to make at that point and kind of adopt a grid then, as opposed to just starting off with a you know 23 column grid or a 16 or 12 column grid. So one way to implement um, a grid system is with the class-based grid system. So align elements to the grid by applying a system of predefined classes to markup. So a lot of you will probably recognize this. Um, this is the foundation grid framework. And this grid framework is created by actually having these sets of predefined classes like um, you know, large two or large three columns, large nine columns. Um, those all have CSS properties applied to them. And you actually work with this and develop this grid by applying these classes to your markup. Um, this is really good for prototyping, for making things quickly. It's good in situations where you have like complete or a lot of control over the markup especially in your layouts, which um, isn't always the case in Drupal. You know, it's getting better, but there's sometimes there are things that are just hard to actually apply this class to that you need to make this grid system work. Um, so here's an example of what that markup might, might look like. One of the earlier, earlier problems with this approach in responsive design is you would give something a class like um, I think Bootstrap used to use like span eight, and um, that when you when that class is applied at different screen sizes, you know you might not always want that to be eight columns. You know, at a smaller screen size, you might want it to be a full twelve columns. So there were some issues with like the semantic nature of that, of like you know. I declared this to be eight columns, but I don't want it eight columns here. Uh, so the way that uh, a lot of grid systems are addressing that now is by using these these prefixes for like small two, large four. So in this case, you know, small two means this should be two columns on a mobile layout, um, and four columns on a larger larger screen. Uh, another approach to that is the semantic grid system. So align elements to the grid by applying layout properties to selectors using a grid framework. So here we're not actually, we don't have a set of predefined classes that we're using. We're able to apply the CSS and all the math involved with it using a grid framework and a preprocessor. So these three examples here are all the exact same uh, the same layouts defined in three different grid frameworks, or SAS-based grid, grid frameworks. There's Singularity, SUSE, and ZenGrids. Now all these pretty much do the exact same thing as far as the final output. Um, just the syntax is a little bit different and the actual underlying math and obviously the, the underlying features that come with the grid system are different. Um, so essentially these are just saying for the primary elements, um, make it eight columns wide, starting at the first column. Uh, for the secondary element, make it four columns wide, starting at the ninth column of a 12 column grid. Um, so behind the scenes, like how those are actually implemented in CSS, um, one common way is using float layout pattern. So create columns by floating a series of elements with defined widths. So we already saw this earlier. We have um, a primary, secondary, tertiary con containers. And we want to create, say, three columns with that. Um, we just give, give each of those the 33% width. And then we float them left. And now we have three columns. So a lot of grid frameworks. Um, were implemented this way. Uh, this works really well if 
you don't know how many elements that you're going to have. So say you have a view showing like profile teasers of all your staff members and you don't know if there's going to be 9 or 11 or 24 staff members. So you can apply using this this type of layout you can apply that and then they'll all just kind of flow around into multiple rows of content. Um, works really well in those situations. Um, adding padding to each of those. Here we're using uh, box sizing border, border box, which uh, if we add padding to the element, it's not going to affect the oversized width of or the overall width of it. So we can add padding and it's not going to change the fact that it's 33% wide. Um, by default, browsers use um, uh, border box um, content box. And that would actually, if we added padding to something, that would actually make the box larger and it would cause that last one to wrap around. So here we're doing the same thing. We just changed, um, changed the width to 50% to create two columns. So an alternative to that is isolation layout. So given a series of floated elements, give each a negative trailing margin in order to reset the orientation of the following element. I think this is much better or much easier to describe with an example. So here we have that exact same layout. Everything's lined up three columns across. And using the isolation method, we'll actually give a negative right margin of 33 percent to all these elements. And what that does is it kind of collapse the space that that occupied and sort of overlays everything. And what you get is kind of a, a set orientation on your elements so that you can then, with left margin, be able to position those across the row and anywhere you want. So this is really good for if you have like a complex grid system that you can position these things by isolating them from their surrounding elements. Um, so it gives you a lot, of, a lot of flexibility in where these items are placed. You can change the order of things. Um, it works for, you know, if, you, if you're implementing a site with the right to left language. And you can, uh, by messing with uh, or playing with the settings for clearing, you can actually have, say, we have this primary container. We have secondary container that's taking up the right hand column and it can flow down as far as it wants because it's floated right. And then the third container, tertiary, is only clearing left. So it clears that first item but it doesn't clear the second one. So the second one can get as long as it needs and the third one will just kind of bump up underneath it. As soon as we clear right, with an element, that's going to clear the, the secondary column. So if you're looking at grid systems, it's good to have one that actually allows you to control the direction of like which way you're floating, because it gives you this flexibility. This is how we did that um, earlier example with um, the ad on the Colorado Public Radio site, of being able to take that um, column down the sidebar and still have the other content that comes after the ads float up underneath it. So I'll talk a little bit about how you apply these to Drupal. Um, I mean, none of, none of what we've talked about so far is Drupal specific, it's all CSS. So as long as you can apply CSS to the right places in Drupal, then you're golden and can use it. Um, but where do you do that? Um, a lot of times we do this in template files. So we we'll usually have, you know, a page template file is a good example because that's where all your main content regions are on the site. So applying these classes directly to page templates and creating alternative page templates for different layouts. That works really well. Uh, as these things are recursive, uh, if you have to do layout on an in individual node, adding these classes directly to node templates works really well. And then on the user side, uh, user profiles. 
Um, when you do this, you can often end up with a lot of template files. So one great way to share like these common layouts across different template files is using theme hook suggestions. So in Drupal 7, you have to do this um, in pre-process. So we, you just tell Drupal, um, sorry, I'm gonna back up a little bit. So this is an example of, say if you need to override the front page template in Drupal, you do that with page dash dash front. Um, if you wanna override the article content type in Drupal, you wanna override that, that node template, you use node dash dash article. Those are theme hook suggestions that are already built into Drupal. You can add as many theme hook suggestions as you want. And you do that through pre-process. So these are just little snippets. This isn't a full example. But we would have this variables array that we pre-process for the node or page template. And we can give, based on whatever logic, whatever PHP we, logic we have on the server side, you know, with the page, you can do it based on the path of your page, if someone's logged in or not. Um, with the node, you can do it based on view mode or content type, or again, if someone's logged in. And you just create these theme book suggestions. So it would be like page underscore underscore sidebars after is a good example, one that we use a lot. Um, or node underscore underscore teaser, if you're doing like a compo component layout. And then you, this is just a way to allow a lot of different content on the site, reuse those same templates, and it keeps your templates um, nice and maintainable. Um, another great way for creating layouts is using CTools layouts. Uh, there's a few modules and a couple themes out there that actually use CTools layouts. Um, panels and display suites both use CTools layouts. Omega 4X. I believe, I haven't actually used it, but I believe it uses C-Tools C layouts. Um, and a C-Tools layout, what it allows you to do is actually define a layout for your site with specific regions and a specific CSS file for it and a specific markup. So if you have, um, if you're creating regions uh, the normal way in Drupal, you do it by adding them to your .info file in your theme. And basically that means that you have this one super set of regions that no matter what page you're on or what layout you're using, those are the reason, regions you have available to you. Um, CTools layouts allow you to define those regions for each specific layout, which is really nice. Uh, you don't end up with like all these regions called like above content or above below content or sidebar first last all these weird regions that you need to kind of shim into um, whatever you're actually creating a layout for so creating your own ctools layouts um, you need a dot ink file that actually defines those regions for you and what the layout is called and whatnot um, you don't necessarily need a thumbnail but you create a thumbnail so that when you're selecting a layout, your um, content administrator is selecting a layout. In the Drupal admin UI, they can actually get a preview of what that layout's supposed to look like. Uh, the actual CSS to create the layout, and then the actual template file, the markup for your layout. Um, here's just an example of the .inc file. It has the title, the category, that's where it's gonna show up in the admin UI. Um, the icon is the thumbnail. The theme is the, you're actually creating a theme hook in Drupal. So this is going to be whatever you put, the string you put in uh, your theme variable or property key, whatever it is for an array. Um, that is going to be the base name for your template file. So in this case, our template file is gonna be sidebar dash after um, dot tpl dot php. And then an array of the actual regions that you can put content in. Here's an example of what this 
Um, this layout would look like, pretty simple. Um, the template file, I apologize, the, the uh, syntax highlighting in this um, thinks that the opening PHP tag is actually a comment. So don't copy and paste this into your, your file. Um, but this is just simple template file. It's, it's uh, addressing the actual markup of our layout. And then the actual CSS. So in this case, you know, usually our layouts are going to be more, much more complex than this, but this gives you an idea. So this CSS is actually going to be loaded dynamically on any page that's using this layout. Um, you can also define the admin CSS, which is the CSS that's going to be used when this um, layout is previewed, say in the panels UI. So you can load separate, maybe a um, a smaller CSS file that doesn't collide with like, you know, your seven admin theme or whatever. You can load separate um, CSS files into the, the admin UI. So I want to talk a little bit more about design patterns and where you can actually find them. There are some examples of them. So UIPatterns.com is a great example of actually defining um, patterns. Now this pattern or this pattern library is actually pretty dated right now, um, which is unfortunate because it's really good about actually giving good concrete examples, giving reasons why you would actually use a pattern and the actual context that it applies to. So if you're just looking for general information about um, design patterns, this is a good place to go to for examples. Um, Luke Rabluski wrote uh, multi-device layout patterns, which is just a quick rundown of some general solutions for um, creating layouts on for responsive sites. Uh, Brad Frost has responsive navigation patterns. These are patterns that are specific to the actual problem of how um, you do like menu structures or nested menu structures, complex menus on uh, mobile devices. So that's definitely good. He also has just a general, I think it's called thisisresponsive.com, um, which is just general patterns for responsive design. And where a lot of people have heard of design patterns in the past was actually a book that came out in the 90s about object-oriented programming um, called Design Patterns. It's also known as the, the Goff book or the Gang of Four. And this is applying design patterns to actual object-oriented programming, which is a pretty interesting read. The cool thing is that this is still very relevant today, um, even though it was written back in the early 90s. Um, but the idea of design patterns didn't come from graphic design or web design or computer science. It actually came from architecture. So an architect named Christopher Alexander, um, back in the 70s while he was a professor at UC Berkeley, put forth this theory called the timeless way of building. It was all about designing buildings not by their actual form, but by the human interactions that they're designed to, um, to facilitate. And he followed that up with uh, a pattern language, which is 253 different architectural patterns that him and his colleagues documented um, based on observations from like some of the most timeless and beautiful places around the world. And these patterns don't just talk about architecture in terms of individual buildings. They work on a much larger scale. So like how, how to design like a whole region and within that like cities and how do you relate cities to other cities. And inside of that, like neighborhoods, recursively just like the layouts we were looking at, all the way down to the actual building, uh, how do you design the entryway um, what's the built-in furniture and what are the things that you hang on the wall? 
Um, so it was very vast. And these patterns allowed just the layman, someone who wasn't necessarily trained in architecture, to actually design the buildings that they lived in just by applying these specific patterns to their specific design problem or architectural problem. So to give you an example of that, um, pattern number 241 is called seat spots. It says choosing good spots for outdoor seats is far more important than building fancy benches. Indeed, if the spot is right, the most simple kind of seat is perfect. In cool climates, choose them to face the sun and be protected from the wind. In hot climates, put them in the shade open to summer breezes. In both cases, place them to face activities. This brings up an important point that um, design patterns are not designed. They actually wrote this pattern based on going out and doing research. Him and his students went out on the campus and they actually observed all these different park benches around the campus, like where people were sitting, you know, which benches were, were full of people, which ones sat empty. And then they wrote that down. It wasn't necessarily somebody just saying, yeah, I think, I think good seats have cushions. And then, boom, that's our pattern. They actually did it by observing things that worked. You have to try something, and then the things that work, they actually get documented. So design patterns are observed. It's a very, port very important distinction. You can't just go out and design a, a design pattern. So what does that mean for us as developers and designers? So start looking for patterns in your own work. And you're solving a lot of these problems over and over again. Like just try to take note of what are the solutions that you're using. You know, be mindful of feel good code. And what I mean by feel good code is the stuff that, you know, you're writing it and it just like it clicks, you know it's going to work. It's tested across different browsers. You know which situations it's going to work in. It doesn't matter in the terms of the layout, like how long content's going to get. Um, the layout's still going to be preserved. It's not going to break down. And then figure out what you need to do to make that re repeatable. Like try to abstract the actual solution from the specific problem that you're addressing to make it work in different contexts. And also define like what are those contexts in which this pattern doesn't work. Like we looked at the, you know, the float uh, grid pattern and there's places that that doesn't work well. The isolation pattern isn't gonna work for something where you have a whole bunch of unknowns, like how many elements. You can't go in and actually say for all 24 elements, I want this in the second column or third column. So it's all about like finding which solutions work when and then share it with others. And that's what I'm doing today. So thank you. Um, this is just a link to the actual session. If you wouldn't mind leaving some comments, let me know how it was, if you learned anything. And we do have time for questions. So if anyone has any questions, there's a microphone in the middle. Anyone? No? My favorite pattern? Ooh, depends on the context. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think the, the gutter pull one of being able to, like the example of the book teaser, being able to pull one element out of a bunch of elements without having to actually define the layout and all those other elements. That one, like when I figured that one out and realized that it worked everywhere, like, I don't know, it was a good day. <laughs> yes. Would you would you mind stepping up to the mic? Sorry, this is being recorded. I'm just uh, starting to 
work with design patterns to learn and to, to have a feel for them. And uh, I was also uh, questioning myself, uh, how come uh, can be a pattern be implemented while doing test-driven development? Where you're starting from a test, where you're starting from the solution kind of, and you have to figure out, okay, which pattern fits the, the needs for my code. Are you, are you asking how to choose the pattern? Yes, something like that, yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's defining, defining the context of what, I guess, which pattern it's going to work in. Um, which will be the, the blueprints regarding which the developer could decide on, on the correct weight of pattern of kind of should be implemented. Hmm. I'm not sure if I have an answer to that. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> that's all right. I may, I may not actually understand the question. Could be the problem. Well, it's all right. Never mind. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I was wondering, it's more of a UX question for mm -hmm. people creating content than a layout or design question. But when you use CTools layouts, what, what do you guys use so that content creators can pick a layout um, do you guys end up using context or panels, or and how do, um, how do you integrate like layout control with content creation? And I, and I know it's not quite the topic of your talk, sure. but you guys do this a lot, so yeah. I mean, so hand in that. panels, we have used Display Suite quite a bit in the past, and in just about all of those cases, the particular clients that we work we were working with didn't want to even mess with that. Like they, they didn't want to need to get in and um, actually change that layout. But the same, the same admin UI that we were using was available to them. Um, panels is something that we've let, um, or we've had clients actually use. And panels has a nice interface for actually choosing the layouts. I think creating those thumbnails is extremely important. Um, I've actually created a, just a Photoshop template for creating those thumbnails, thumbnails real quick. So for each custom layout we do, we create a thumbnail based on the desktop version of the site. Um, and I think that's, that's pretty clear if, well, it's clear in the context of the panel's interface is clear and easy to use, which it isn't. But do you guys use IPE, like the a front end editor for panels, the inline oh. editor, and then let people mess with that? Or do you, uh, the we, content creators go through the panels back end and then pick a layout yeah, and then the, you kind of mock it up somehow? The panels back end. Okay. Um, so my issues with um, IPE is that, that in order for that to work, it needs to add additional markup, which in a lot of cases will break the responsive layout. Your descendant have. selectors uh, suddenly explode. Exactly. So, no, we haven't. And I think, I don't know, it's, it's a tricky issue because um, responsive layouts, they're, they're complex. They're, I don't think there's any way around that. And when you start adding additional markup in CSS to handle like this WYSIWYG editor on top of creating layouts. Um, I think, yeah, it's that's a tough nut to crack. Thank you. Oh. Could you give an example of where things might have gone wrong or if you've realized midway through a project that perhaps you would like to have implemented things differently? Would you go back and kind of re-implement those things? Or do you just kind of put that to one side and say, right, we'll do it better next time? Uh, yeah, so naming things is always hard. Uh, that primary, secondary, tertiary naming convention is something that came out of a lot of pains of naming something like sidebar. And then all of a sudden, we want to change the layout and it's no longer a sidebar. Um, 
So naming things is often something that I have to go back and refactor. And I've found the more general you can make something, the better. You know, if you're styling layouts um, based on like a class that's say node article teaser, like it's a layout specific for the article teaser. And then you have this other content type called uh, news or whatever you want to call it. And you realize that, oh, I can use this exact same layout for this, but then you name it, you add that article teaser class to it, and then all of a sudden, like the semantics of that class name have gotten jumbled because you're naming things based on a Drupal implementation rather than the actual design semantics of it. Is, is that good? You want, you want more examples of when things have gone bad? <laughs> No, that's, that's good. I suppose, um, would you say it's to do with documentation and kind of trying to set standards for yourselves internally that you're carrying through to the next project? Yes. Um, so documentation is something oftentimes we'll start off documenting things well, and then as you get down to like crunch time and actually implementing a project on budget, like that that becomes a very much like it's a lower client priority mm -hmm. than getting the site launched and done so then it kind of comes down to you know does your doc does your client want to actually pay for the time to go back and document mm -hmm. you know it's it's a business decision yeah thank you hi hi uh, uh, you mentioned uh, architects who had written a book of good patterns, yeah, and it seems like a really useful thing for architects. Is there any kind of similar resource, a book or a site that does the same thing for patterns that can be used in sites in Drupal? And, uh, um, not that I know of. Yeah, definitely nothing specific to Drupal. Um, or not specific to Drupal, some, something at all. I mean, the, the ones that I, I listed for, like, Brad Frost and Luke Robluski are good in terms of just, like, responsive stuff. Um, are there, are there specific, type, specific types of problems that uh, you'd be looking to solve? or no, just in general. Like there isn't. We should start one. Okay. All right. Thank you all very much. Oh, sorry. Is the presentation online? Yes, is the presentation online. Um, yep, this is on uh, my GitHub page. I will add a link to the actual session uh, page on the DrupalCon sites. So go to that link, find the, the slides, and give me some feedback. Thank you.